Hi, so I'm Tara Lynn. I am Webster. And we're going to have some conversations. Yes, we are. So, so <laughs> let's, well, let's begin with uh, questions. So just a question from my video that you watched. Yeah, we just watched each other's videos and came up with like a question for each other. All right, so my question is, you talk about how you're into like memories, building on memories, building on memories. So let's see. I got my little happy <laughs> student here. Okay. Um, so your pro cognitism. Cognitism. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and you're kind of like con memorization. But you kind of talk about revisiting topics like 24 hours later to like solidify the information in someone's brain, which is kind of like how people can learn. Uh, isn't that memorization? Yeah. So that comes from Dominic Gregorio of the University Choirs. Uh, so if we, we, we talk about how if we revisit stuff within a maximum 24 hours, it'll like solidify and help keep the memory. But yeah, I guess that is technically memorization, but I do argue that that works with the idea of cognitivism where you have a foundational memory and then you can build upon that and build upon that and make it bigger and bigger. So while I'm, I guess when I say I'm against memorization, I'm against kind of brute memorization. So I don't like to see just straight up, let's drill students with 60 questions <laughs> or let's just keep doing the same thing over and over again, beat the dead horse and hope it works. I'm against that type of memorization. I do think there is an aspect of memorization which actually is developed from understanding. So once you begin to understand something, your memorization starts to come out of it. So I guess I am against memorization in a way. In a way, I do think that if we are considering brains and the way we process information, technically memories are memorized. So I'm against brute memorization, but I think in general, learnings and lessons and understandings do still come from memorization that way. Okay. What you got for me? Well, I hear you're the um, teacher that's going to have a fanny pack of manipulatives <laughs> yep. for your science and math classes. So my question would be, and I'm thinking this is going to be best to view in a science perspective because there's a bit more on the notes portion, but you can go either way, I guess. If you're still doing the closed book approach, so you have a closed book exam. Mm -hmm. During the assignments and the practice, student A was able to use all these fun manipulatives. So I think we did blocks in the one example. So they can use all of these to help, say, balance a chemical equation or something. Mm -hmm. And then student B, instead, is allowed to reference like a periodic table or their notes. Isn't allowed to do that? So I guess, test aside, that student's able to use his manipulatives. This student's not, or this student's able to use their periodic table or their notes as a reference. But then once you get to the test, how can you approve of manipulatives but not approve of this content? Because in their exercises, that's content that the student used to do the exercises, just like that manipulative was used to do the exercises. So would that not turn this just into a bias open book test? Okay, so I'm going to go back to we're kind of assessing their understanding, right? So I'm kind of going to take this as this student is doing open book, um, not of like kind of not as like an approved adaption for this particular student. So the way I see it is if they got all of their notes, um, they're really they're kind of demonstrating their ability to find like be organized but they're gonna end up with examples in their book. And then they're gonna have a question on the test. Um, maybe they're supposed to figure out what this is going to become. 
if they just go by their examples, like and copy the steps here, then what they're proving to me is they can follow a procedure. So if I ask myself, do they understand this? I might have to like, honestly, the answer is I don't know. And if I can only base it off of this, the answer is no. Where this student, um, so in this case, they had a bunch of blocks sitting next to them during the test. Um, if they choose to like decide this is going to represent um, sodium and then they have like a couple other blocks to do H2O. Um, and then they build a few other molecules to like balance their equation. If I ask, like, do they understand what's happening here? I'd say the answer is yes, because I didn't build the molecules for them. I just gave them pieces of material to play with. So I'd say my question in the end is, can like, it's the big question. Did they understand like the content? Game time. We have this lovely beaker full of little notes related to topics we thought we wanted to talk about or topics from the class type thing. And this is kind of hidden on like the discussion of like what we learned over the semester and stuff. We want to discuss them and also mention them. So these are just kind of highlights of the semester, but we're going to just pick by and blindly read it out and go for it. So... Also, if you've been curious about the board, it's not like a presentation tactic. It's literally like my personal adapt <laughs> adaption. <laughs> I'm very visual, hands-on person. And we literally have conversations like this all the time, which somehow I lead us somewhere where I can draw on things. <laughs> so this is like everyday us. Mm -hmm. First one, real world connections. Okay. So I guess... This is kind of referring to the like third or fourth class in January and February where we're really like, and I guess also the social oh, justice constructionism. Yeah. Okay. So the project-based learning, that's how you're going to get real world connections, mm -hmm. right? Because you're going to have, um, you can ask the students then to like search newspapers, um, current events. Um, so I thought a lot about this, okay? So I did a lot of work with like the graph work and like data collecting. So with students, I actually want to spend time like data mining. One, like career-wise, lots of jobs like are involved like getting data and like being asked like, what does this mean now? They have to make decisions based off of that. So it'd be kind of like great to use like the Canada revenue like surveys to have the students go get their information from there and then they can make their graphs and learn about all their different functions like logarithmic exponential well i guess for a technological connection um if you're liking that and you want to go search like cra or search like the the weather agencies in viral canada uh -huh. um there's this place called callisto based in calgary and they make this thing called the Juniper Notebooks, which I don't know if we'll ever see here, but they're ba like they're being seen in MIT and stuff like that, and they're going into high schools, and it allows you to take from these open databases. So you can just take from all these things, and then it goes in. I know it's the sun now, but uh, you can take from like Enviro Canada, or you can take the text of Hamlet. So it gives you science connections or English connections or math connections. And then it does this data analysis thing for you. So I think it's cool because it takes that real world connection, gives you certain things you can do. And it also adds code in my favorite word. So mm -hmm. I just, uh, you just made me think of that. That's a perfect relation to that. It is. I'm going to play a little devil's advocate with real world. Like we debated that in a few other classes. Sometimes real world like connections means real world to, like the students. Like mm -hmm. what did they consider like within their world? Because um, we talked a lot about like adapting questions to relate to the students, and it's so superficial that it just it really doesn't matter. Well, and I guess the other part, and I, we can end this this one on this, but with math, I, unlike what most people think. We actually have all sorts of outcomes built within because Miss uh, Dr. Gail Russell, when she was writing the um, curriculum, she included 
hey, go find this topic of research based on something math, or hey, go and pull this stuff related to probability in the real world. So I guess real world connections, it's not only here and for assessment, it's built right into our curriculum now. We have to assess for it. So I think that's, I guess, a cool thing. But group work. This was yours, wasn't it? Yeah, so we kind of buds heads on this. So when it comes to assessing group work, I really struggle because, oh man, even at a university level, there's three people sitting around, one person's doing the work. So like you can go around to all the tables and like see the t kids are working, try and come up with, I think formative assessment is okay but even when you like you come talk to us and like it takes pretty in-depth conversations to like realize that they understand what's going on and maybe they don't but now you're going around to like oh you might not catch everything that's going down so at the end of the day when you're trying to say like who understands and who doesn't i don't necessarily know if you can collect enough information to do summative assessment even though like we're trying I feel like I've been trying to like be taught that. Like, what, like, what do you think? I think group size is a big thing. If we have big groups, you better have a project that's going to be huge. But even then, like, um, in a group, I guess, if you have a big project and there's like an A part and a B part and a C part and a D part, and each member does one of these, how do you know that this member knows that one and this member knows that one, or how do you know that this member knows this one? Cause see, so, you're, you're bringing in like real world collaboration, right? Where people work on different parts. Mm -hmm. And then now I guess I would feel more comfortable marking this group work because I could mark them on this. So you're gonna have to be very careful on um, that you know, like what I guess this entails for assessment. Because then I feel like you're might gonna have to follow up on something where the student the student was intended to like after sharing with their group learn their parts, but to know if they did, you're gonna have to add something else. Like they're gonna have to reflect on the whole thing as a whole or be tested on the whole thing as a whole. And even like we've been doing group assessments this um, semester, I find with those you still end up with like primarily this one and this one or even just that one person <laughs> does it all and then they get ideas from other people but you still have one writer yeah so 110 i did that whole wiki i did the whole wiki <laughs> and three other people got the grade but yeah keep yeah so so yeah that's where that's where <laughs> i'm wondering like on one hand if you do individual peer assessments where you evaluate each individual person i don't think that's good because sometimes you get, oh, I don't like this person. Or, oh, I don't like. You get biased as well. Um, but then when you do a group assessment, you almost end up with the same issue where the one person doesn't want to rate themselves poorly. So as a group, you're assessing your work, but it's still one person. So I don't know if you would, I don't have a solid solution. Ultimately, like if you're worried about it, I think you should do, um, well, I, I still feel like I love group work, especially like in math, even though like a lot of people don't even can't even imagine it. But I think we do it, learn it very well um, is for formative and inquiry. Like, I feel like it's an activity for them to learn and like build from each other. But I just I don't feel comfortable with it being a form of summative assessment. So, again, I think if we can like. For example, like a presentation might be different. I guess I'm thinking of like being assessed while they like do the activity where uh, there's yes. no big products involved. Well, and like, so for Atlee and I, when we did our pre internship, we actually moved all the desks. They were originally in rows, <laughs> and we moved them into eight learning communities. Kind of like that. Mm -hmm. And so. There was four people per table and there was talking and there were some people that definitely leaned on other people. But ultimately I found 
it kind of gave them a collaborative portion where they could bounce ideas off each other. And I guess this comes into, you don't necessarily, you kind of like streaming and filtering. I don't because I like seeing student teachers. So if this person's stronger, well, maybe their content knowledge stronger, textbook strong, but now can they teach those people? Can they explain to their group mates how to do stuff? Only if you do it in the right way. Oh, I can't even know if it was this class or not. Um, but so there was a, like a group. So like the kids did, it was peer assessment. I did a project, like I learned about peer assessment and they, it was applied to math. So the kids would go on their own and do their own problems. And then they'd have their group mates that they have to like share with. And the person who shares first would maybe be the person explaining why they weren't able to do the question, but what would they maybe have done? So they would go first. A uh, second person, if they didn't get it, would explain where they got stuck. And then they, the other students would feedback like, oh, like, this is my approach. This is what I did. And then they're all supposed to like share how they went about doing this answer. So then they're all learning. So it's it's kind of like the kids are, are given a bit of a procedure of what they're supposed to cover in order to like make sure that at least like the discussions you're helping direct the students and having productive discussions mm -hmm. what i find without like this procedure thing that i saw i think you're gonna get i did all the work and i don't like i guess you would have to sit down in your class and have like really good discussions with them to tell them what your expectations are then when they work in a group because without, I think, really strong, like pushing to see if you can like get your kids on board with this belief, they're not being the teacher leader. Uh, su success criteria. Oh, I guess. So we've been talking about how rubrics are bad, but not necessarily bad, just easy to be biased on. And so I guess success criteria is supposed to be the answer to that. So instead of having your grid of one two three x y z mm -hmm. and having like some more lots instead of having something like that you have this idea of oh okay sorry it took me a couple seconds um see i this is after this like for my pre internship like i used this so i use like obviously a rubric plus a scale because I weighted my stuff and I did the numbers on it and I had my like whatever is written in here. Um, I feel like I find this less helpful because these give you, like they kind of teach you what the teacher prioritizes. Mm -hmm. Whereas like when you read this box and you might focus really heavily on like a couple things in here and that wasn't really it was the wrong thing like the teacher was like oh you kind of missed the point i really wanted you to do like this a little more it sounds weird because you should do the whole thing but mm -hmm. usually it's not kind of 100 well, percent how it, things go it doesn't really explain grades like if you have sections off like i think we had that in class where okay this part was worth 10 percent. this part was worth 90 percent you still don't know the individual boxes, what they're worth, what's more important and not important. Oh, yeah. And I find, like, yeah. like, I find, and yes, this can be bias, but I think you as a teacher have to work with that and develop it, consult peers. Okay, what do you, okay, I need you to clarify what you mean by bias. So how, like, I feel like I'm, <laughs> if I'm very, very clear on my expectations, like, how am I being, like, biased towards marking? Actually, that's the key. So being clear on the expectations. So okay. if you are crystal clear with it and you actually describe what you need. So essentially, I think I personally, I think I prefer a rubric, but you need to make the competencies that detailed. So the success criteria competencies are very much. Here's your list of things. It's a checklist. I think in a way, if you can combine that with a rubric and you can make this very detailed, I think you will get away from some of the subjectiveness that rubrics can suffer from if you have poor feedback on it. And then in terms of the teacher, that's a lot less work because you don't need to, it sounds bad. You don't need to put as much written feedback, but it's real. I, as a student, remember this 
you gave a lot. So if you have that, you might only need three sentiments. Whereas here, you're backing up every one of those. And the other part, sorry, I guess, is um, if you run into an issue here where a student challenges their grade, mm-hmm. you can consult the student and have a discussion, and then you can consult the teacher, get a fellow cohort to actually, like, take a second look. With a rubric, you can give that to anyone, and they can just do that. I find here there's no real grading scheme, right? I can, you can argue from a teacher standpoint, you're a little more covered in here for like where your grade came from. Okay, that sounds weird. But... Well, but are you? Because you don't, what's Okay, nine... well, okay, so here's the thing. Are you giving these rubrics to your students? Like I did one and I gave it to the students. I guess But I found both. it a tiny bit eliminating or sorry, uh, constraining, because like people said, sometimes you don't realize what you maybe should have focused on until you're reading all of your submissions and you're like, oh, like this actually should be weighted more, or I didn't anticipate this. So, but I guess you could talk to your students be like, I also reserve the right to change it a little bit, yeah. but like not in the way that like maybe lower their mark or something, but well, I, I see merit in both. I could see myself using a rubric behind the success criteria almost to actually give, give the, this to the students. I feel like you put you're all this. about like this column you're giving yeah, them. Yeah, like because you're not I explaining find... where it goes down. But you know, then I then you're missing that point where I was saying sometimes you can tell what they find more important because you're like, oh well, if you do some of it, it's here. Or if they're like, you don't have a hundred percent, like it's like, yeah. like I don't know. I don't know on this. I'm so, I think I need to study it more, but my issue with this is I really don't know. Once you put all that feedback in, how do you get that grade? That's my issue with this. Because now you're thinking it has more to do with the teachers, like more to do with instinct and like comparing to each other than actually had preset rules for how like, the grade well, comes out. For yeah. us with math, it's <laughs> most of the it. time it's, well, most of the time it's really different. We don't have rubrics because it's literally right, uh, wrong, or like we do make marks for like procedural things or mm-hmm. understanding, but we don't have, we don't use these too much. Okay, so speaking on section number three, how we perceive our work as educators in relation to disrupting some of the more traditional approaches to assessment in light of the significance of the 21st century competencies. Uh, We find we're doing this pretty much, this is what math is moving towards. So we recognize that both of us are very much on the idea about like, what does the grade mean? So previously, what do you were saying with the performance based grades? Yeah, we're kind of so used to um, if you look saw a student's grade. Um, I think traditionally people look at that and it not only says, oh, wow, they know this topic. Well, there must be hard workers, good students, which in a way, I think in the business world translate to like, oh, like they probably would be a good employee. But we've been talking a lot about how this is supposed to match their understanding of the outcomes. So hypothetically, there could be a student who maybe isn't quite like a hard worker who's always running late. Um, They could have qualities about them that actually don't translate to a good employee. So um, I know some businesses are actually gone away from looking at grades. They're not asking for them. But those who are they kind of expect this to tell them more about them than just their understanding of the content. And so that I guess, how much is education supposed to be working towards like businesses, wishes and stuff? We're teaching the curriculum and the content, right? Is this exclusively for business purposes? Because um, like I'm recognizing the 21st century competencies, but in terms of the actual grade, we can teach these within this it's just not going to be exclusively saying oh if you were late you lost marks if you did this you lost marks i think we aren't marking them on this um i kind of asked the question whether or not we kind of more well okay so in math like i can argue like we're marking some of these things but i feel like they're not getting a mark that says 
their critical thinking skills level is this. Um, <clears throat> so we're not really catering to like the business world, but we're so focused in education on the outcomes that when you like look at the rest of the like curriculum, these are in our goals, like having the kids like work together, pe people magic, um, management skills, um, number sense, like we're are working towards these, I think it just kind of seems to be in the sections where we're not assigning grades. So grades aren't associated with that, but we are working towards teaching our students these skills. Mm -hmm. um, and companies are just going to have to go about their normal way of finding out if they have these types of um, skills here um by of course like they do interviews and of course like you kind of go through a trial period um with the companies because um i have heard that too like so a couple people are competing so maybe there's like somebody else that's close behind um but they have better people skills they're still going to be like more hireable like even like you're like oh that's pretty close but i'm talking like there could be significant difference between grades and companies when they're looking for like these types of skills might actually take this student over our employee now over, over an 80 percent student okay well i would somewhat argue that or I'd wonder, so with math, with the critical thinking and the creativity, creativity has been essentially dead in math for the previous, like the traditionalist stuff. So I think in math and especially what we've learned in the U Regina program, these three are huge. This is literally the focus. We are moving towards, um, problem-based learning, which is going to be enhancing your complex problem solving and your critical thinking. And we are trying to avoid like giving away answers because that's going to be creativity and recognizing the fact that their math is an art. So there's like seven, eight different answers for everything or ways to the solution at least. So as much as we aren't marking that explicitly, I'd wonder if it is there technically. Now we are, like you said, we aren't catering to the businesses. So I I don't know if that's a bad thing. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily say it is. But um Well, I'd say like a, in a way we are because okay, so we kind of both have agreed that we're both not a hundred percent for mm -hmm. tradition. So we're kind of going for like things that you might not normally see, like group work. We're gonna do projects presentation so they have to work on their verbal skills as well like to talk about like math and what they're doing um so presentations in math um so we're kind of working towards other way forms of assessment which is going to bring this stuff in like uh, we're definitely working harder towards this and when we're talking about employability um so of course like I'm 10 years older. I've worked in a few industries. I've worked for a bunch of the crowns and kind of like a common theme or like a main thing, like they've said um, that they're looking for is they want people who are like good at asking um, questions. So sometimes it's like collaborating in a room and like it's sometimes it's like the someone asks the right question, which leads to like where we should go next. So what we're worried about with the tradition, like here's my examples, copy my procedure, do it. They're not thinking for themselves. They're not being like creative. They're not getting into the higher levels of bloom. Um, and we're not like setting them up to be like successful, mm -hmm. right? We're creating robots. We need to we we have robots we have computers you know what i mean like so we don't want to create yeah we don't want to create these little calculators because human brains are capable of so much more we need to go beyond that okay um and i suppose lastly in they also mentioned mo modalities on here and i know you've been struggling with the idea of adaptions only to the point that we, if we're going to be doing so many adaptions, teachers almost need a lower workload. But 
I would almost think, so with the multimodalities, that's talking about thinking visually or thinking spatially or thinking textually or thinking. So I would wonder if we're doing group work, that's going to introduce different modalities. It's also a different environment. So that's probably going to do an adaption of its own there. Project or presentations, this is different than just calculations. So in math, it sounds super weird, but if we can get like presentations and projects in, then I think we are doing some justice to multimodality. And then also the idea that we're doing problem solving, but we're also still doing some lecture, but not necessarily direct. There's a bit more questioning. So I think in terms of what kind of the reform mathematics that we've both been learning about and both kind of been working towards, I think that does hit on these pretty well. And I would almost argue, <laughs> well, I erase a little bit. Uh, I would argue that with these multi, like these 21st century competencies, kind of the critical cognitive portion is covered by your maths and your science <laughs> and your com computer stuff. Um, I think those subjects do cover these first three and all the entire category of cognitive thinking. Um, and we do cover these, but in terms of what does that 80% mean? I think this is still very much curriculum based and that's probably not a bad thing. So we say they did learn 80% of workplace and apprenticeship 30. If they have 80% of that content mastered and we can prove it through the curriculum, I think this grade is still fine. And that will naturally include these. But then these we can include on there. It won't necessarily be displayed as much. But then when you look at the other subjects like yeah, they might be more involved in like the social and the Englishes and yeah, stuff like that too. Oh, and like health education. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of these subjects, if we actually look at the reform math, reform science, if we look at getting out of the traditional read this, do this, memorize this, spit this out, and we go more towards discussion-based, project-based learning, we'll be naturally hitting these with those. And so personally for us in mathematics, in terms of the idea of how we're going to be disrupting these traditional practices, I think naturally we're doing it just by doing reform math. So if we work towards more tasks, more projects, that critical thinking aspect that we've been working so hard for the past three semesters for, um, that should hit most of these or all of these. And as an educator, we can reflect on that over time and try to do more and more. So going off of those 21st century competencies, going into like the idea of how our experiences in education previously affected us. Yeah. I know you talked a lot about how you're constantly fighting your kind of need or wants to go back to the traditional, just straight direct lecture. And for me, I, no, not direct lecturing in like the horrible sense like i still want discussions and the like to break off of children and actually like um it's not so like i struggle with the traditional teaching it's i struggle with the traditional marking like assessments like maybe falling back on to like tests definitely like the easiest way that you're gonna find out if they can know this information um, versus like having six different things for kids to do seems a little overwhelming, but I am, I'm coming across the idea like that's going to like, they're going to learn so much better doing things that way. Cause I know I would have, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, then I have trouble with like what the mark means. Well, and I know for me, I've always kind of struggled with this debate of performance versus um, curricular. Uh, this goes into the idea of like late marks and stuff. So um, we're talking about, 
well, we had a discussion in class about this, the difference, a uh, uh, discussion or a debate, I think it was more a debate, but <laughs> the idea of like, does 80% mean you only know 80% and you lack 20% of the content, or does 80% mean you met expectations, but you didn't exceed them by 20%? You're kind of thinking of the university standards and like what they're marking mm -hmm. towards, which I don't, is not quite going backwards like into high school or elementary. Um, but okay, one of the big debates was should like the student who hands in their paper on time, who gets 80% the first time, like are they worth, like is that now worth less because a student handed theirs late? maybe didn't do so well, got a rewrite to eventually end up with this. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's going back to like, like business thought, right? Honestly, productivity and being able to work and think quickly and get things done. I would argue that they might be in a better employee currently. We're also talking about students who are growing. Mm -hmm. um, well, and so for me, I my biggest idea of this, I actually had a discussion of this with my teacher back in high school and it was in computer science and it was because I could do a project in a day or two, which some students could do in a week, which another student could do in two weeks. And it was that discussion of how does the performance fit into the grade? And I, back then, I, this has haunted me pretty much since because I have been constantly fighting that because in my mind, in some ways, there is authenticity to that. This student technically could process that information better. And in my opinion, that would mean they actually have a better grasp at it. But then See, once you get in. But the problem is that's not what the mark says. Yeah. The mark is, is your grasp on it. Now, like, I get what you mean. Like, performance-wise, like, there's a way that you can, I guess, weigh the students against each other. But we're not doing that when it comes to the mark. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so here's a really good example, writing papers. So my fellow classmates are like, yeah, I did that in an hour. Me, I'm like six hours later yeah, is yeah. like the story of my life because I'm, for writing is not my great skill. It takes me a little bit longer, but that doesn't mean I actually don't understand less than them. Sometimes it, like I maybe understand more than they do. Mm -hmm. um, it just depends on like your skill, right? Yeah, and like. Yeah. You're also forgetting different reasons why like they were late, right? Has nothing to do with school. Their family took them out of town. They're dealing with something else, right? Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't be like, mark, like penalizing them on something that isn't what we're marking them for. And I definitely agree. So yeah, yeah that's, that's probably my main thing. I've been fighting from like the traditional education, my background in it. And I think oh. you've mentioned that a bit too. But. Yeah, don't get me wrong. Like I was all about, oh, late marks, 100%, because like it, like I feel like it mattered. And then part of the teacher, I was like, man, like what do you mean like all the kids could hand in all their work on the last day and I have to mark it? I'm like, are they going to pay me an extra two weeks to do <laughs> this? Like, though in reality, like we're not talking like the whole class is doing that. It's one or two. And if it's at the very end and they're not really like, getting everything done, it is more unlikely they're, they are like performing really high on things that they are present for, like a test. Um, so then you're probably looking at other solutions for mm -hmm. those students. Yeah, exactly. So I guess that would be my idea of the educational background that's been affecting us that we're fighting and how it's shaping our understandings. So I do think overall, like we both come a long way. I think for me, this was my semester of like, oh my God, like this other way is better. <laughs> yeah. And you said yours was like about a year ago. Yeah. So for me, it was when I took the 200 course, which you weren't able to take, but we both had it kind of in our e-math courses. They challenged us so far. And I think I, you said it last semester, uh, you said something about, you almost feel unf that it's unfair that you're now doing this and your students get to do this, but you never got to do it as a student. So it's. Uh... Oh yeah. Like I did hours of homework every day <laughs> since grade three, like, and I'm in university still doing hours of homework, even though they're telling me I don't have to make other people do homework. Um, so I am struggling with that a little bit too, like the no homework thing, but um, it's, it's coming around. Yeah. 
So yeah, that's us on assessment and evaluation in terms of our traditional education.